I think so, but I, the one thing I will wonder, well, I'll just open the meeting and say, we'll call the meeting to order and welcome to everybody who's here with us. This is the regular meeting of the Board of Education of Castro Valley Unified School District. And we're happy that you're here with us. Uh, our first thing is to know if there's any public comment on any of the items that are on the agenda for the closed session. So Amy, if you're there, do we have anybody who would like to speak? No, we do not. Okay, since there is no one, we will recess to close session. And I think we will return, I believe it is at seven, is that correct? Yes. Seven o'clock, we'll be back to open session. So thank you all for being patient with us and we'll now reconvene to close session. See you in a little while. Session here at our meeting. And the first step in that is to do the Pledge of Allegiance. And we're very happy to have our student member here, Shane, to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. So Shane, take it away. All right. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Shane. Uh, the board took no action during closed session. We'll move on to approval of the agenda. I think there are some changes to the agenda. Yeah. New personnel report, I believe. Is there anything else? No, just personnel. I'll move approval of the agenda as amended. Thank you, Lavender. Is there a second? Thank you, Michael. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any uh, further discussion? Hearing none. Well, let's see, can't do that anymore, can I? I have to call them by name. So um, Shane, what's your vote? Yes. Okay, um, Lavender? Yes. Michael? Yes. Dolly? Yes. Dot? Yes. And I'll say yes, so it's approved five to nothing. Admission statement, Trustee Adams. Uh, sure. In partnership with the community, <clears throat> Valley Unified School District educates students in a learning environment that is safe, nurturing, and culturally responsive. Students are guided by excellent inspired staff utilizing innovative instruction, curricula, and technology. Thank you very much, Dolly. Okay, the board respects and encourages the public to comment on matters on the board agenda and within the board's jurisdiction. The board fully supports civil discourse and requests that everyone respect each other and their point of view. Individuals who would like to address the board must raise their hand during the start of an agenda item. To comment by video conference, click the raise your hand button and to comment by phone, raise your hand by pressing star nine to request to speak when public comment is being taken on the eligible agenda item. You will then be unmuted during your turn and allowed to make public comments. After the allotted time, you will then be remuted. Individual speakers are asked to limit their comments to no more than three minutes. There are up to 30 minutes of public comment allowed on each agenda item with board consensus, the president may increase or decrease the time allowed. This meeting is being recorded to prepare the official minutes. So we'll move on to the student board member report. Thank you, Shane. It's a little less than last time, but we have a few good things going on. At the high school, it is we just started Sauce Pop, which is a 10 week period celebrating diversity through student led activities. And that's usually spearheaded by our clubs. The high school is planning on hosting our, our virtual assembly probably in the next couple of weeks. Canyon Web Leaders have hosted multiple virtual events for the sixth graders. High school clubs have continued to hold fundraisers at local businesses. And our high school has hosted eighth grade parent night with a panel of teachers, administrators, and students to answer parent questions and give them a sense of our campus community. Great, thank you, Shane. So tonight we have, uh, as our special guest, Independent Elementary School. So yeah. Ian, would you like to welcome them? 
Yes, I sure would. Hold on one second. Let me make sure I'm not on mute. Yes, it's it's great to have Mr. Patrick Schmidt Hansen here uh, to share all the wonderful things um, about independent elementary school. I know you saw Patrick actually present when we talked about CVVPE um, before, but this is independent elementary school where he's a principal at. So thank you so much for joining us, Patrick. Thank you for having me. I'm sorry, give me one second. I'll have it up in one second. Oh, it's okay. I have some beautiful slides for all of you tonight. <laughs> sure you do. Your website is always a, a treat to look at. I have fun with it. <laughs> okay, you can go to the next slide, Amy. So I like to start all of my presentations with independence mission statement because everything we do should be focused on um, this statement, which is in partnership with the community, independent elementary school educates students in a safe, supportive, positive, and welcoming learning environment where they are immersed in a well-rounded and rigorous curriculum with an emphasis on the whole child and their social emotional learning. Next slide. Tonight, I wanna to focus on this part of the statement in partnership with the community and how we at Independent create a true partnership involving two-way communication and the ability for families to influence policy and practice. Next slide. With an understanding that a safe, supportive, positive, and welcoming environment is gonna look very different depending on the student or the family that we're focusing on. And so it's, it's gonna be important for us to elicit feedback from a wide range of uh, community members and families to, to understand, to truly understand the diverse perspectives that we have at the school. Next slide. So the way that we do that at Independent is through our family friendly survey. And this was developed based on a resource that uh, was provided to us from Nancy Dome of Epic Education. Each year we give this survey one in the fall and then a follow up in the spring. Um, this year, we got over 300 responses to our fall survey, which is about 75% of our population in terms of family numbers. Next slide. So these are the questions that we asked. Uh, this year, we focused on communication because we know that in distance learning, uh, communication is even more important now than it ever was before. And you can see that we ask questions every, everywhere or everything from how the office staff communicates, uh, how the teaching staff communicates, how is our follow up when they have questions, are we providing information for them to know how to support their child at home, and are we sharing positive news with the family, families. Um, and then we also focused on equity because equity is and always should be at the center of everything that we do. And you can see that we've got three questions there that get a sense of how uh, families feel uh, within our, our school community. Next slide. This is tied to our SIPSA or a single plan for student achievement. Um, we have a goal around this survey. Um, the goal is having 88% or higher of respondents agree or strongly agree to the statements that are presented to them. And I want to acknowledge that 88% is a really ambitious goal. Uh, for all of the questions, but at Indy, we shoot for the stars. <laughs> we hope to reach it. Next slide. And so this is how we stacked up. You can see on the left, a brief summary of all of the questions. The teal part of the bar is the respondents that marked agree or strongly agree. And then the yellow are the percentage of families that marked sometimes or needs improvement. And you can see that for seven out of 10 of our goals, we, we met our 88% mark. And then for three of them, the ones that are circled in the black, we were close, but not quite there. And so those are families want to see more positive news shared with them, like positive things that are going on in the, uh, in the classroom and in the school. Um, this year, they feel more disconnected than they have in the past, which makes sense with distance learning. Um, and then families want to make sure that we're creating an environment that affirms students' identities. Next slide. So this then leads us to our three focuses for the year. 
uh, because for a functional partnership, action must be tied to the feedback to make sure that the um, families can see the impact of, of the feedback that they give. Um, so the goals that we have for this year are highlighting the positive, creating community connection, and then empowering and, and affirming our students' identities. Next slide. So let's go ahead and take a look at the actions that we're taking to do these things. Next slide. For highlighting the positive, you can see on the left, um, that's a snip of our staff Google Classroom where uh, teachers submitted what they're doing to highlight the positive in the classroom. And this ranges from everything from picking several students e each week and sending positive messages home and then rotating those throughout the week. Um, to sending snail mail letters. Yes, some people still do that. And it's really nice to get that card in the mail. Um, and then we have our ego wings uh, for our PBIS system. We typically give out paper ego wings as a reward for positive behaviors. This year we're giving out virtual ego wings that the students can go to our online store and buy items with. Um, and then I've got this video of Ms. Krista Samboy, who is our preschool teacher at Indy. I wanna play it for, or play part of it for you and Amy just like 15 seconds of it and then I'll explain why I'm playing it. Oh, hi friends, it's Safari Miss Krista. I'm at my home having my favorite snack, cheese. This mozzarella cheese stick goes so nicely with a nice 2%. Okay, Amy, you can stop it. So the reason that I played this video is the preschoolers obviously aren't gonna get the 2% joke. Um, so what Miss Krista Samboy is doing here is she's putting jokes into her, her academic lessons for the families to bring some, some happiness and some smiles to them while they're having to sit with their kids and do this work. Um, and then at the full school level, next slide. So every Friday we have a virtual assembly, um, a live virtual assembly. And one of the things that we do is teachers and staff members can submit their distance learning superstars for the week. And these are kids that are going above and beyond in distance learning. So they're coming to all of their live sessions. They're doing all of their independent work. They may be cheering on their classmates or sending positive messages and, and stuff like that. Um, but so each week I read their names and the reason why they were nominated and then they get sent a certificate that they can print off and keep for themselves that has the same language on it. We are also, um, you can click, um, highlighting the awesome work that they're doing with our full school activities. So you can see a collage of pictures that were submitted last week as part of the students hybrid prep principal assignment. Um, this assignment, they learned about social distancing and then submitted a picture of themselves with something that's six feet tall or six feet long, which they can then use as like a mental image when they come to campus. They can remember, okay, I need to be my dad's length away from my friends. <laughs> Go ahead and uh, next slide. For our second focus, community connection, before I go to the activities, I wanna point out that the attitude that this kid has in this picture is the attitude that I strive for every day. <laughs> Makes her smile every time. Um, but you can go to the next slide. Um, and I have Christian and Ella here to talk about what um, their, their teacher is doing in their classroom to create connection. It's a little quiet, so you may need to turn your volume all the way up. Hi, Susan at Independent Elementary. us connected to our classmates by asking parents to host classroom parties and even host community events. And we also have a daily lunch and office hours called so we can hang out with our friends and ask questions if we need them. Re recess is my favorite part of my day. The classroom even has a shutterfly site for photos so families can communicate with each other. Thank you for making the students and family feel connected and supported. Let's, Let's continue, continue to soar. <laughs> nice. Our future movie stars. 
And then at the full school level, we have community spirit activities. And so it's small, but you can see January all the way through May. And each week we have one or two activities that the kids can do. And the reason that we do these together is so families, no matter the age of student that they can have, they have something that they can talk about and connect with. Um, so for example, next slide. Last week on Tuesday, I believe it was inauguration day. So the one of the, act uh, the activities that kids did was they learned what inauguration day is. And then they submitted goals for President Biden and Vice President Harris for what they hope that they do during their tenure. You can see some of their goals in the background. I just plopped as many in there as I could. Um, and I was really impressed by them. Like they submitted things about making sure that um, homeless people have food and shelter. They want to make sure that the beaches are clean. They want to make sure that uh, we get the vaccines to people so that we can open up school. <laughs> um, but they, they've got some really good ideas future politicians on our hands. Um, and then this week, you can go to the next slide. Yesterday was the 100th day of school. So we celebrated it by dressing up as if we were 100 years old. This is a picture of what uh, one of the kindergarten classes dressed up as last year um, when they didn't have to be socially distant. And then if Amy clicks to the next picture, this is what they look like this year. <laughs> A little bit different, but we're keeping that tradition alive, creating that connection. Nice, next slide. Uh, if you wanna see the full list of activities and explore that, if you go to Independence website, we've got the spirit activities linked right on the homepage, nice easy access. Um, so I'll let you explore that if you want to. And we can go to our third and final focus for this year. Uh, you can click the next slide which is empowering and affirming our students in who they are. And this is where the real deep work begins. Um, at the beginning of the year, even before the survey, we started implementing the ADL or Anti-Defamation League uh, curriculum that uh, Amy, uh, Nia and Marion presented at a prior board meeting. Um, but this curriculum starts with ground rules and creating a respectful environment where communication and discussion can happen. And then it goes into exploring themselves, who they are, who their family is, is uh, uh, who their classmates are. And then it gets into some meatier conversations. Uh, so kids talk about what equity is and what inequity is, what is dislike versus prejudice. Um, and these can create some pretty intimidating conversations, like conversations that are intimidating for adults to have with our own family, let, let alone with the students in their classroom. Um, so one of the focuses that we're having as a staff this year, um, all CVUSD staff participated in the Mosaic Project's professional development in the fall. Um, and then in the spring, we're lucky enough to have a Mosaic pro uh, Project mentor that's gonna be working with us. And we're gonna focus on, um, and this is the picture on the right, a list of potential topics, potential questions that we're a little bit uncomfortable with and coming up with ways to answer those um, or have those conversations um, in a respectful and inclusive way. Um, so that's the work that we're gonna be doing for the next uh, half of the year. Um, as a full school, you can click to the next slide. We tie this work into our No Place for Hate activities, which is uh, an ADL or anti-defamation certification program. And this is our third year at Independent doing it, two years certified, and we're working for our third. Um, this, the, the way that you get your certification is by doing different activities throughout the year that promote kindness and diversity and equity. Um, and so uh, one of the activities that we're gonna be doing this year, you can click to the next picture is a virtual or a digital escape room where students are gonna use the knowledge that they've learned in the classroom with that ADL curriculum to escape the digital escape room. It's a Google slide that they'll be able to go through. Um, and then another activity that we're doing, you can go to the next slide, is two weeks of kindness. In February, we'll be doing this. Um, and so we've got activities all uh, throughout those two weeks, starting with a uh, kindness cruise where families can decorate their vehicles with kindness quotes and come to independent where um, they'll pick up some materials that they'll be using throughout the rest of the week. 
Uh, for example, on Friday of that week on the 19th, we're gonna, at a virtual assembly, we're gonna make friendship bracelets and we'll be presenting those to another elementary school, which I'm gonna keep a secret for now because I don't wanna ruin the surprise. Uh, but then the following week, we've got spirit days where they'll dress up as different kindness themes and they have a kindness checklist that they'll complete and they'll get to show off at our virtual assembly on the 25th. Next slide. And then in May with our follow-up survey, we're hoping to see that families are noticing the changes that we're making and the impact that their feedback um, is having on independent. And now I get to my favorite part of the night. You can click to the next slide. We've got our student and volunteer recognitions. For our students recognition, our student award this year, you can click to the next slide. We are honoring Jessica James, who is one of our fifth graders. Um, Jessie is one of those people that truly lights up a room when she enters it. Her positivity and enthusiasm are second to no one, including adults, every adult that I know. Um, and she holds a thirst for knowledge and motivation to learn that impresses everyone. When I asked the ND teachers to send their thoughts on why she should receive this recognition, I received paragraphs upon paragraphs from them, even from teachers that Jessie has never had, um, about what an amazing person that she is. But I thought the best person to sum up why Jessie should receive this award is one of her current teachers, Miss Carson. If you click to the next slide, we've got a video of her. amazing student. I've known her since kindergarten. Every year she is such a hard worker, such a kind friend, and such an amazing student in independent elementary. This year she has gone above and beyond getting her work done, going to office hours, and being a leader for the other students in her classroom. We are so proud of her and so excited to see her bright, bright future. We're very proud of you, Jesse. Congratulations. Congratulations, Jesse. And then for our volunteer of the year, we are giving it to Cesar Yusan. So Cesar was actually the first independent parrot that I met. He was part of uh, my interview panel, which will give you a sense of the, the level of support that he's provided to independent. Uh, prior to my arrival, he was the vice president for the NDPTA for two years and then became the president for the next two years. And during those leadership roles, he was supportive and responsive. Um, when he was making decisions, he always thought of all students and strived, always strived for what was fair. Uh, he's got this unique gift um, of making everyone that he talks to feel understood and appreciated. And even in the toughest of situations, he's able to create um, a calm and positive environment. But the aspect of his leadership that really impressed me the most was even with his full-time job and two, two students um, at separate schools, he was able to be on the independent lower block top every day to greet parents and field any questions that they have about the PTA. Last year, he took a year off from the board but was still just as active as before. And then this past spring with an up and coming new president he had a surprise nomination for VP. I swear it wasn't me, but he stepped up uh, to support and took the role of vice president this year again. Um, with his youngest child now in fifth grade this year, he's going to be moving on, but he's going to be thoroughly missed. Um, congratulations, Cesar. You do amazing things and I couldn't do this job without you. Um, so that sums up my presentation. Thank you for having me um, and I'll stay in the line. Well, thank you, Patrick, and thank you, Pendant. Uh, are there board comments? I'll start with Lavender. Mr. Hansen, um, it's always great to see you come. You bring that energy with you. I know you wanted to be that young gentleman, uh, but you bring that with you every time, and it, it's, it's quite contagious, I have to say. Um, I, I want to thank you for what you're doing um, in regards to gathering data and gathering data from families. I mean, 75%, that's, that's a, lot of, a lot of participation. And the striving for high goals of 88%, those are big goals. And it looks like, you know, you did really great and you're looking at the gap areas. And those gap areas 
as you said, are very important areas. And I want to commend you and your team for really weaving equity into that conversation. People have spoken up, they've said it. And, and just them speaking up means that you're creating spaces that people feel more comfortable to speak up saying that they don't feel safe. That's, that's a feat in itself. So I want to appreciate and thank you and your staff for all the great work you're doing in that area. We need it. And we've got a lot more work to do. Um, I want to congratulate Jessica, um, helping out younger students and really um, shining and being that sunshine. I say, you want to be that little boy. I want to be her when I wake up every day with that smile. And lastly, uh, Cesar, you know, you've helped out so much in our community and we need parents like you and that can keep the calm and help everybody else feel welcome. So thank you so much for your support. And thank you again, Mr. Hansen. Appreciate it. Hi, Mr. Hansen Schmidt. Thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. I was laughing and laughing at the picture of the kindergartners dressed up as a hundred year olds because I guess hundred year olds wear animal print jackets now. Um, but that was adorable and I couldn't stop laughing. Uh, I loved the pictures and the descriptions of your programs. Um, of course, equity is, is the thing that we are all working toward. Um, and it's so wonderful to see how you've woven it into everything in your school and especially in this time when it's so hard to do all that. Um, and I wanted to ask, I was very impressed at your very precise 88% goal and um, that you're doing another measurement in May. And do you have a goal for a percent increase that you hope to see in May? So the goal is uh, an end of the year goal. So for seven out of the 10 goals, we met it already. And then we're hoping that we meet it for the other three too. Oh, well, that's awesome. Okay. Great, thank you, Dot. Anyone else? Michael? I just wanted to congratulate Jessica and Cesar um, for being a part of, a, I'm amazed by this independent uh, a community I've, I've learned about tonight. Um, uh, Mr. Hanson Schmidt, wow. Um, the metrics that you brought tonight um, really demonstrates so much about your community and what your values are. And I think in uh, the times that we find ourselves in, um, leading difficult conversations uh, is really important and it seems like you're well equipped to do that and I, I just want to thank you for, for, for tackling that and doing it in a very thoughtful way. So thank you so much for what, all of your work there. Thanks, Michael. Dolly, did you have something you wanted to say? Oh yeah, just a little bit. Um, uh, Independent Elementary is a really wonderful school and this was a beautiful presentation. Uh, I congratulate Jessica and uh, Cesar. Uh, they seem like uh, magnificent people. Um, I was really nervous when I saw the teacher with the glass of wine there, or the, it wasn't a glass of wine, it was just a glass. And then she poured the 2%, I'm like, oh, thank goodness. <laughs> Very cute, that was adorable. Thank you. Arvind? Yes, I, um... You know, uh, I just, I feel, I have said to Patrick already that I feel we are so fortunate to, that he came to Castro Valley um, to have such a, a reflective, amazing leader in our community. And I know that he, along with the rest of our principals work very closely together. And when you talk about data, they, every single, principals meeting, they spend time, we spend time looking at data, they spend time with their teachers and staff looking at data and it's just, it's just the thing they do. Um, I, what I really love is how you commented about being, it's really about being responsive to the need, that this is the need and this is how we're going to respond. I love the video by Krista Sambo. She's an amazing teacher, by the way. Um, she has the preschool and she actually um, is seeing children every week um, in person. We, we've just seen her good work all the time um, in the past as well. I love the, all the creative things that Patrick and his team and his community come up with, including the 100 year old, you know, looking 
but you're 100 years old. But, um, and I wanna um, congratulate uh, Jessica for, for positivity, we need that. And I love how you take control of your learning. That is key in everything that we do as, we, as you grow up, um, you have already started that. So that's great. And Cesar has always been welcoming. I remember that when he was a uh, PTA president, always with a smile on his face, always very supportive and welcoming when we visited as well. So thank you, Patrick, you're doing an amazing job. Thanks. So Shane, did you have anything you wanted to add by chance? I don't want to ignore you. I just echo everything that everyone has said. And especially thank you for including that part in the presentation that you had the students um, give what they wish for with Biden's presidency. Mm -hmm. Those things that gives me hope for their future. So thank you for including that and for giving the presentation. And of course, congratulations to Jessica. Yeah, so, you know, what the problem with being last on the list is that most everybody has said everything so nicely already, but uh, I will reiterate that I, I really admire what you're doing there. The innovation is terrific. The high standards uh, and the goals that you set are terrific. Uh, and certainly congratulations to the two award winners there, Jessica and Cesar. Uh, that's, uh, they both sound terrific, so that's great. Uh, and I do have one suggestion for you, and that is to take that list of uh, items and actually send it to President Biden. And, you know, maybe that'll give him some guidance or uh, at least send it to Eric Swalwell and see if he'll pass it along uh, <laughs> to the president and so forth. But thank you very much for your presentation. We really enjoyed it. It was really very well done. I'm not surprised at all, but I'm always uh, happy to see it and enjoy what you've done and the work going on up there. So thanks so much for being with us here tonight. Thank you. Okay, uh, we'll move along now to reports from our two bargaining units. Do we have a representative from CSEA tonight? I'm sorry, we skipped an agenda item, the video. Yeah. yeah I'm sorry, have... I did. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I did. Ah, my fault. So, we do have the presentation of the winners for the classified yeah. uh, staff. So sorry, Arvind. Yes. Yes, I'm very excited to share this with you. We have a um, Amy. Thank you so much for putting this together, and everyone for sending questions. She's made a video. Um, we want to just share some of the pictures of our classified members who've been here since March helping doing work um, at the district level in on school sites. Um, and I can't thank them enough. Our hubs could not have started without them. All of the work that we are doing to prepare and our office staff welcoming, opening school, continuing to support um, everybody at sites um, and everyone at the district level, just kind of doing everything we can, they can to um, our classified members, everything they can to really uh, get us in moving in the right direction. So with that, let's watch the video. Thank you so much. I love all their smiles on their faces.
Yeah, we, we are so lucky to have them. And I, I just, you know, when I walk around or visit schools and see them with a smile on their face, always working so hard to support our children um, and our staff. So thank you, thank you. I wish we could be in person so we could actually see you. And I wish we could actually get to a point where we can hug you, but <laughs> we'll wait for that. So thank you. Lavender. I just want to really quickly echo the video and really thank the staff. Um, I work in a site services organization. I know what it takes to keep things running and you run it so smoothly that people don't recognize all of the hard things that you're doing to keep it that smooth. So thank you for enabling education and enabling a safe space for our kids, parents and staff. Yeah, I think a lot of times when we think about schools, we think teachers are the first thing that come to mind, but clearly we can't run a school without the classified staff. So they are extremely important and a full member of the team. So that was a nice presentation and we're and, glad and to honor them. Dolly. Yeah. Yes, I, I just wanted to say something like uh, in all the years that I was a teacher in Castro Valley Unified, the classified staff, the secretaries, the people, maintenance uh, people, those people are just so important and just um, they help create the culture of the school. And um, Castro Valley has just wonderful classified people. And I think the presentation shows that. We're gonna, um, we're, we're gonna go ahead and post it on social media. I, I won't be redundant. I, I just want to thank the classified staff. Y'all keep things mo moving. Thank you. Yeah, Sherry, I was wondering if you had anything to say since you've made an appearance here. No, we just wanted to recognize all the classified employees that have been working all summer and have come in every day and doing everything they can. And so we just want to recognize them. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Well, once again, thanks to uh, thanks for honoring the classified staff. They've earned it and deserve it. So now, since I made that mistake previously, we will move on to our reports from the bargaining units. And I wonder if there is a CSEA representative here today. Um, I do not see Robin on the call. Um... Okay, well, we can move on to see if there's, if and I, uh, Mark I do not see to... Mark on the call either. Okay. I, I don't think either were attending. Okay, that's fine. Do we have any uh, public requests to make public comments for items on, that are not on the agenda, Amy? Uh, yes, I do. I have one hand, um, oh, sorry, two hands. Um, first, I have Sarah Fetter and Connie Hill. Um, just give me one second. I will remind everyone that uh, due to the Brown Act, uh, we on the board are happy to listen to comments on items that are not on the agenda, but the Brown Act prevents us from discussing it or answering very much of a question or anything. So. Please don't be disappointed. It's not that we're ignoring you. It's just the law for open government. I do, is Sarah, are you on the line? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Sarah, welcome to our meeting. Uh, thank you, uh, good evening. Uh, I wanted to comment on two issues related to special education. First, I would like to bring up the issue of legal spending within special education. I have raised this issue many times, and I am again asking that the school board request a detailed analysis of legal spending for special education in our district. I am asking that the school board take a close look at legal issues in special education and ask whether they are being handled in the best interest of the district and its students. This is an opportunity to reduce spending and develop collaborative rather than adversarial relationships with families. The second issue I would like to comment on is the Special Education Parent Advisory Committee that was recently formed. 
I'm concerned that there hasn't been any communication with special education families about the forming of the committee that is meant to represent their needs. I'm concerned that there was no opportunity for the public to review the plans for this committee and no opportunity to comment publicly on it. Transparency is a word that is often thrown around but rarely seen in practice when it comes to special education in Castro Valley. I do not believe that an advisory committee made up of parents selected by the district is going to provide the district with the feedback needed, nor will it give all parents a voice. If Castro Valley is genuinely interested in improving special education and ensuring that all really does mean all, the school board trustees and district administrators need to listen to all voices and engage in some difficult conversations with all families. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, we will now uh, mute you and welcome our next speaker. It Connie. looks like we have Connie Hill coming on. Welcome to our there meeting, I am. Connie. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm actually one of your classified employees at the at the high school, at Castro Valley High School, and I just wanted to say thank you for the lovely tribute that you gave us and the lovely words that you all had for us. Um, you're right. We are often people who sort of fly under the radar. We're there. We do our job. We do it well well and uh, we don't always get noticed so I just want to say thank you tonight for giving us uh, well-deserved recognition all of your classified employees in Castro Valley do work very hard and we do love our students and um, you know it's appreciated that when when you recognize that so thank you on behalf of myself and my fellow classified friends and and uh, dear friends that I work with thank you very much Connie and thank you for all your work and service for the students here. So that's the only two that we had. So we'll move on to the next item, which actually is a five minute break for us. Uh, we've actually been going now for a little over two hours. So uh, we appreciate the break. So we'll reconvene at uh, seven, let's say 7.50. Thank you very much.
Well, welcome back. Uh, we'll start again. Uh, we'll move on to item nine. This is a consent agenda. It's an action item. I'll make the motion. Oh, oh. No, no. You go for it. I'll move the consent agenda. I'll Thank second. You. <laughs> you guys could fight over it or something, yeah. maybe. So it's been moved and seconded to approve the consent agenda. Is there any further discussion or comments? Uh, hearing none, um, all, well, I have to call the roll, don't I? I keep almost forgetting that. So Trustee Whitaker. Yes. Uh, excuse me, I've made, made another mistake there. I have to ask our terrific student for his prefer preferential vote. Sorry, Shane. You're good, yes. Thank you. And Lavender, I got your yes. Uh, Michael? Yes. Dolly? Yes. Dot? Yes. I'll say yes, so that makes it five to zero. So we're moving on. Hopefully we have our superintendent there somewhere. Yes. To She's item here. number 10, thank you. <laughs> See her, yeah. And um, onto the roadmap. Yes, um, next slide. It's gonna update everybody again. Thank you, um, Amy, for highlighting the latest and the greatest data on what's happening in the county. We're going in the right direction. Um, so next slide. Um, so I wanted to just share a few updates from the county health department first, and then go into some of the updates I need to give you about our, what we are doing. So as you know, regional, sta um, regional state at home order um, for stay at home has been lifted. So that's great news. Projections of hospital beds is improving. Um, our case rates are also dropping. Uh, we're kind of, what we're hearing is we are on the tail end of the winter surge, hopefully, but we must all stay vigilant as this isn't, this is really far from over. Um, next, you know, we don't want to let our guards down um, and end up back where we were. Um, again, continuing with that, uh, they are allowing transitional kindergarten to second grade, are allowed to open based on county and state um, guidance once you are in the red for five days. Uh, the required COVID safety plan and state checklist uh, that's the, the checklist is the new thing um, that they have required us to have and um, will need to be posted on the state website five days before school um, reopens. It's basically kind of a summary of what we have. Vaccination, um, we do have a link in here actually if, um, Amy, if you could click on that link because <clears throat> I think if you go down a little bit, um, I saw, uh, when I put the link in here, I actually saw a list of who's first, who's second, uh, that whole guideline. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe while we're doing this, Amy can and look it over. And, oh, there it is. I think it's called prioritization. If you click on prioritization framework, there you go. So basically, as you see, there are phases. There are four phases. Um, phase 1A, 1B, 1C. We are actually uh, in phase 1B, we're included in phase 1B, um, which is, you know, essential workers, education and childcare. So, but just wanted you to see that there is information on this website about how this works, when this is coming up um, and all of that. Let's go back to our presentation. What I am, um, back to this, the page we were on. Thank you. So uh, we, um, we understand that we are in that phase uh, and the plan has been updated. So maybe by mid-February, they would start with uh, mass vaccination sites. Um, and there's just a lot of logistics and details to be worked out. Um, one problem, as you have heard, is there aren't enough vaccines in California and 
in our county, we have a lot of healthcare workers, um, more so than I think some other counties. Um, anyway, all of those things are in, in the works. Um, I know that we have already put our name in and we have in, in our conversations with the county, uh, with our county supervisor, Miley, as well as through our nurses and student services, we have, we are pushing to have to be a vaccination site, just like we do the flu clinic to hopefully get um, our employees and the community um, support the vaccination of um, people, not just our employees, obviously after we're done with our employees to open it up to everybody else. Um, so that's where the vaccination piece is. Not clear guide, you know, guidelines or timelines yet. Next. So for us um, in CVUSD, um, we know we've already talked about this, that um, schools in CVUSD are prepared to open. Um, as you had mentioned, as we have mentioned, two weeks, right, which was what the guidelines were before. Open two weeks after the county is in the red tier, which hopefully will uh, be coming up. Um, I put in parentheses adjusted to ensure smooth transition because as I have said, dip, you know, if it ends up being on a Thursday um, or when at the end of a trimester where they're just, they need two days to finish um, all of that work, um, that that would be what we are gonna do. Phased reopening. So this is the, the phases. Uh, this is the, the, the way we're gonna bring the um, students back to KK first, then one, two, then three through five, and then of course, secondary school later on. Our reopening safety plan has been completed. As you know, it's posted on our website and the county's website, site-specific plans are posted and schools are doing a great job. Principals and staff are doing a great job preparing families uh, with videos and information and all sorts of things and our um, classified staff just helping to make sure everything is in place. Next. Um, so we have already been testing staff on site and we are working on, um, we're actually piloting student testing. Um, we are working, um, I know Ms. Chan worked with the company that's piloted, that's helping us pilot. Um, I believe they were looking for a school district that actually has hubs open at every school and we were the only one in that group. Um, so we'll be doing that. Um, student testing will be implemented um, when we reopen with parent permission. Um, and um, we have a tentative agreement with CVTA on reopening elementary school. That tentative agreement now needs to be voted on by CVTA members. And we are hoping that gets done this week. Um, we are working with uh, CVTA also to complete reopening MOU for secondary school. So that's the one that we're working on right now. Next or I believe that was the end of my presentation. Any questions, comments? Michael? Yeah, I have a few questions. I'm just hoping um, if we go back to that first slide, uh, just a point of clarification, I think it's just helpful for the public to understand that being in the red is seven, right? Seven cases per 100,000. Is it the adjusted rate or is it the non-adjusted rate uh, that, that triggers it? So actually there are two things they look at. So. Okay. In fact, I think Amy checks this every day and I love how she explained it to everybody <laughs> last time somebody asked. So, uh, uh, Amy, do you wanna um, jump on and? Yeah, so um, they look at both the overall test positivity, which is currently at the 7.7, .7, and then also the adjusted cases, not the unadjusted. So if you look at the bar chart above, it represents the unadjusted, I'm sorry, the adjusted at 28.9. So that's what they look at. Um, so currently we're at 28.9 and 7.7. .7. So we're in technically in the red tier for positivity, um, but we're not overall in the red tier. Yeah, and 25 is what they look at. So right now we're 28.9. Um, and at one point, if you remember, we were way lower than that. So. Thanks for clarifying that. Um, I, was just, I had uh, two questions about the testing, if, if you could just clarify something. What does it mean to pilot? I, I, I know what a pilot is, but oh, okay. what, what's the scope of the piloting? 
And yeah. I'm, I'm curious with, as we go into testing, um, what if, what if families opt out of testing? What's, can they do that? So can we talk yeah. about that? Yes, absolutely. We do need parent permission and it's not an opt out, it's an opt in, in order to test. We cannot force children to be tested. Um, it's not legal, um, but as far as pilot, it's because this company is actually um, has tested students in college, uh, but not in elementary schools and, and uh, K-12 schools. So they're just making sure they work out all the bugs. Um, the test is actually, um, I know that at Parent Leadership Council, I mentioned that the test would be, so for us, it would be once a month, unless we actually have what, what they have for the incentive grant at the state is if you're in purple, but we um, are not going to stay open in purple. Um, so the the test is also, I know they asked, is it the nostril one? And I, um, at that point, I did not believe that it was, but it actually is, but it's not the one that, um, that most of us have experienced as adults when you go to get your test outside. It's pretty, um, pretty easy and just like, kind of the bottom part of your nose. So they're just piloting to make sure they work out all the bugs. We have to figure out how to get, you know, permission slips and, and get results back to families and all of those kind of uh, logistics and the uh, legal issues. And we're starting that this uh, coming week. Okay, any other questions or comments? And I do agree that, oh, okay, Mike. Sorry, I'll just ask one final question. So, okay, we, we get into the red. Um, what happens? What, what gets triggered in our district? We, we have 14 days. Um, could we just open the doors tomorrow or, or does that, what do we do in those two weeks to get ready? Two weeks, well, we've been getting ready since August, since March. So mm -hmm. we just, uh, honest to be honest <laughs> with you, um, we're ready. We have everything in place. The only thing right now we're piloting is the student testing and that should be done. And, and we also have the testing that we have for adults. That same company also does testing for students. We're just trying to find different options. Um, so within those two weeks, I think it's just time for families to kind of figure out all the, you know, the logistics for their children's daycare and all of that. And for us, to um, make sure that our staff has enough time. Our teachers need a couple of days also to just plan because they haven't been in their classrooms. Um, their classrooms are not set up. This would have happened at the beginning of the year, but since COVID, um, we were dealing with COVID, they haven't had a chance to do that. So just putting the last touches in, and that's why they said five days, but five days is a, a pretty short timeline. Um, but we we are ready. If, if um, you know, when we go into red, we should be ready to do that. Dot. Um, I just wanted to say something about vaccines since I've worked the vaccine clinics for the county and um, touch on, on the complexity of vaccine distribution. First of all, um, I think our county, we, we don't have enough vaccines for everyone. The state of California only got 2 million vaccines for 38 million people. So that's one barrier. And as Parvi mentioned, we have a large number of healthcare workers in Alameda County. And so those are the first priority to be vaccinated. And we're still bringing healthcare workers in, behavioral health workers in um, to be vaccinated. And then suddenly the governor um, opened up vaccinations for 65 and up. So that meant an influx last week. I don't know if any of you went to the library, but there was a line a quarter of a mile long for people to get vaccinated. So there's a lot of desperation in getting this vaccine. So these um, points of distribution or pods as they're called have are basically trial runs while we're getting healthcare workers vaccinated. At the same time, there's a working group who's looking at equity, who's looking at accessibility, and where other pods as well as max, mass vaccination clinics will be. So there's a lot of moving pieces and we're hoping that by mid-February we'll be able to move into teachers, food, ag, and, um, and those essential employees. 
Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think to your point, um, Trustee Theodore, there was a lot of mis, just misinformation. People were sharing things like you can go get your vaccine. There's a line at the library, but not everybody qualifies. Um, in fact, you know, some people had like links to sign up and, you know, they actually went to wherever they were assigned and that was really for healthcare work. Right, and, and just a PSA, even if you have a link and even if you have an appointment, if you are not 65 and you are not a healthcare worker, you will not get a vaccine, yeah. even if you have an appointment. That just means that you took an appointment from someone who could have gotten an appointment. Yeah. Um, and the vet library is no longer doing walk-ups, so just a PSA. <laughs> No, thank you. No, thank you for, for that. And, and um, let's just cross our fingers. As you said, the most important piece also is we have to have enough vaccination, vaccines. So hopefully things will get better. Well, I agree that the numbers are encouraging. Uh, we hope that they're real. Even Fauci today was saying that he's starting to uh, believe them. That's really good. And we, of course, we don't have any major holidays now, which were the, I think, the cause of the uh, tidal wave of infections that were through here. So we're just getting past that. But, you know, Parveen, also when we start, um, not if, but when we start, uh, is there still the staged or the, the phase, I should say, uh, opening of elementary, then higher grades and so forth? Yeah, yeah. It's still part of the plan. Yes, absolutely. So first we have to open TK2 <clears throat> and then the rest of the um, students before we go to secondary. Right now, the focus is really on elementary at this point, but we're hoping to get to that point. And, and that's why we have, we wanted to finish our MOU with the elementary first before secondary. Uh, Amy, are, are, is there anyone who wants to comment on this? Yes, our... we have one public comment from Amy Franklin Willis. Okay, great. Welcome, Amy. Haven't seen you for a long time. Are you there, Amy? Hmm, maybe not. Amy, we'll give you another moment. Hope you're there. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, glad to hear you. Okay. I haven't seen you for a long time. Hi, nice to see you. Thanks for letting me um, comment and so helpful to hear this particular presentation. Um, for those who don't know me, my wife and I are parents to three Castro Valley Unified kids. Our oldest is a CBHS class of 2017. Our daughter Grace is class of 2021 at CBHS and our youngest is a freshman at CBHS this year. So tonight I, I wanted to um, speak as a voice for the 692 families that have seniors this year. As this reopening conversation and planning begins to feel a little more real for senior parents and senior students, uh, the big looming event is graduation. And we have not yet had any communication from CVHS about planning for, for graduation. And we're three and a half months out. Um, I attended this uh, PTSA meeting last night and uh, directly asked uh, Mr. Torpy about what was what was being planned and the response I got um, was that uh, CVHS had done graduation last year and that they would be in touch with families and that is really not reassuring for us with kids who have missed their entire senior year. Um, class of 2020 got the majority of their senior year, though clearly missed out on the last part of it. Um, and I think the graduation that was pulled off in two and a half um, months was extraordinary. And I know families that were so pleased. What I really, and I, there was a lot of activity on the Facebook page for parents of this class, this today, is we've got to figure out if we can only do what we did last year, 
we've got to do additional items. We've got to figure out as a as a community how to honor these kids and what they've accomplished and what they have um, persevered through this year. So I know that the board is um, not in a, in a capacity where you're going to you know be able to. Um, I just am asking for all these families, you know, that want their kids struggle to be recognized. And I, I know that we may be right where we are by May. And so we may only be able to do the kind of distancing that happened last year, but we may not be, we may be in a different place. And I want to be assured that there is planning so that if we are in that different place, we can execute. And then there's a whole community that's willing to help do that. And right now we're not getting communication about how to help. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Uh, Parveen, do you have any comment on that that might be helpful to Amy? No, the uh, other, than, other than everyone's working really hard to get things done and I am absolutely sure there will be there is planning and there will be, and I, I agree. I mean, these kids lost their entire senior year. So we will do everything we can. Um, we are also in, con, uh, you know, in contact with other school districts, high, high schools. So a lot of that starts happening now. Um, so I just want families to know it's going to happen. It's just that, you know, there are so many other things they, all the school districts were working on that now we're actually getting to that point where everybody's having those conversations, so absolutely. Shane, did you want to say something there? Um, as ASB school board rep, um, in our leadership class, I'm in charge of advising the senior officers. So I know as of now, they haven't made a plan, of course, with admin or anything for graduation, but based on where we are at with COVID, they're making different plans based on the tier. So let's say we're in yellow or better, we would love to have graduation with maybe one or two guests. If it's a little higher, maybe just graduation that has only the students in the stadium and rather than going up to the stage, they just stand up. And if worse comes to worse, it'll just be a drive like last year. Mm -hmm. uh, Dot, did you have your hand up? I, I wasn't sure whether. No, whether. I'm sorry. My son just came home, so I was waving. Oh. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I think I, I, I want to make sure that uh, the speaker knows we don't usually comment. It's not really appropriate, but I just wanted to make sure that you know there, there will be planning. Things will happen. We just need to give uh, staff a little bit more time as they're working with, you know, all of this and working with other districts and kind of figuring out the different options. But, um, Amy, thank you for raising the issue and making us aware of it. We appreciate that, and I'm sure that. Uh, Arvin and Mr. Torpy and Shane and his uh, group will be working hard on this. So uh, any other comments on this topic before we move on to our auditor? Nope, well, I guess we'll move on to item 10B, which is our audit report for this year. <clears throat> yes, Ms. Chan will start us off. Thank you. Um, so yeah, we're excited um, that we have um, our auditor here tonight to present a couple of audit reports to you. The first one is the 2019-20 audit report. And uh, you have in the packet a, a full report uh, uh, provided by Nigro and Nigro. Uh, Peter Glenn is uh, the auditor um, who will be presenting, um, uh, just giving you a a quick overview of the report and um, also um, uh, we'll be um, able to uh, answer any questions that you may have. Um, so you should have received also a letter that came from Nigro and Nigro um, uh, along with the with their report. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Peter. Good evening, members of the board and cabinet. I hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, First question everybody gets, right, on a, on a Zoom call. Um, but again, thank you for having us out uh, tonight uh, to present the report. And as um, Susie mentioned, I'll be really brief and, and handle any questions that, that you have. Um, so basically our audit um, took, it started last year about this time as it does every year. And of course we 
we kind of went through radical change in in the conditions as our audit covered the July 1, 2019 period through June 30, 2020. So um, it, it really um, changed some of, some of the way we had to do some of our procedures. But uh, in the case of your district, actually, we were really successful in getting out the district on a couple of occasions and, be, and were able to work uh, you know, in, in the offices and, and work with everyone. And uh, did and although we used our, our secure portal for a lot of our documents, um, a lot of it we were able to you know handle out there in the field. So we were really appreciative of the district for working with us and making the audit run smoothly and really being able to issue the report. Uh, at this point in the season, uh, you may or may not know, but the state actually allowed for reports to be filed all the way through March 31 this year. So, um, but we're very happy to. Um, yours done at this point. Um, so like every year, our audit um, had to be in conformance with general uh, auditing standards, uh, governmental auditing standards, the K through 12 audit guide, which is the state. And they dictate basically the format of the report, the types of schedules that go in there, what it needs to contain, um, compliance um, and all that. And then the uniform guidance, which is the federal piece and, and the, the uniform guidance, the uh, addendum to the uniform guidance actually came out uh, in pieces this year. Um, there was a part that came out in August and then September. And then there was one that even actually came out just before Christmas. So it was um, because of all the, the uh, funding, the unique funding from the CARES Act this year. So it was um, you know a different year for auditors as well as, as everybody. But um, so, our audit covered that that period. Um, as you look at that report from June 30th, it's a snapshot in time, right? It, it basically tells you where you were as of June 30th. It covers the activity for the full year. Um, but what it does provide, it provides an independent opinion on your financials. And our opinion is that um, is an unmodified opinion, which means all the, um, the information that's contained in your audit report is fairly stated. There's no uh, misstatements that would materially affect the financial statement opinion. So that's a good thing. Um, so you can basically move forward with those budgeted, you know, those budgeted expectations now moving forward from in all your funds uh, and, and be able to have confidence that, you know, this has been independently attested to. So we wanted to um, make that comment and um, Really, uh, as far as highlights go for the district, um, those are those are mentioned on page three of the audit report. A little bit of information on there. I think the biggest the biggest uh, takeaway, at least financially, uh, is the uh, spending in the in the building fund. So a lot of capital outlay there, about twenty eight point five, twenty eight point six million actually in the uh, in expenditures in the in the building fund. So that's still uh, seeing a lot of activity and. And hopefully everybody will be able to get out there and enjoy those uh, facilities, you know, in, in the coming weeks and months. I'm sure you're all looking forward to that. So um, I think that covers everything that I had uh, meant to talk about when it comes to the district's audit report. So clean report. Um, and uh, again, we want to thank um, the district, Susie, and, and also fiscal, Tricia and fiscal for all their assistance through our efforts. Well, thanks for that. It's always good to get a good, clean report and everything. And uh, that's, of course, important for us that, to know that we're doing the right thing with the community's funds and so forth. It's also good to hear that uh, you had a good working relationship with the district, you know, to, that uh, you guys worked well together and were able to get all that done. So we like to hear that, that things are working smoothly. Sort of not surprised to hear that, but it's all—it's always good to hear an independent uh, outside person uh, say nice things about our district. So, did you have anything you wanted to add, Susie, for example? No, um, uh, just uh, that we appreciate, um, you know, uh, our auditors. Like we do, uh, uh, there are so many changes. And so um, I know that uh, Peter is one of those that I can call and, and, and just kind of, you know, uh, talk to you about uh, the changes, uh, especially with the CARES Act funding. So we all know that, that those come, um, you know, uh, to us 
restricted. And so uh, we want to make sure that we're doing, we're spending it, uh, uh, you know, based on, you know, what's uh, allowed um, uh, per the federal government. government. Uh, also just be, uh, we'll also want to thank, I know uh, Peter mentioned earlier that um, Trisha, Trisha has played a big role um, in, you know, making sure that uh, our financials and also um, just uh, uh, sending all of the reports out to, to Peter and his team. Um, that is uh, really uh, uh, huge for us because, uh, you know, we're not talking about, you know, a couple of pages here. We're talking about hundreds and hundreds of pages of documents. And so it's, it's, a, long, it's, a, it's a long checklist. And so, um, so we appreciate the work that uh, Trisha and her team um, have done and also um, other departments too, because they're also involved in terms of um, uh, looking at our unduplicated count uh, that um, it, you know, it involves the child nutrition department as far as our free and reduced students. And then our ed services uh, and to us, uh, uh, regarding our, you know, uh, our uh, EL students and also our uh, homeless students. So, so we appreciate uh, everyone's work um, in getting this 2019-20 report. Um, and it's like uh, uh, Peter said, it's it's a clean audit, which is uh, we're always happy <laughs> when it's a clean audit, like Very. Uh, Mr. Howard said. Are there any comments for uh, Mike? Y'all are going to think I'm crazy, but this was like the highlight of the board packet for me uh, because you said 2 CFR 200. Um, in my day job, this is what I get. I work with this um, at the University of California, and uh, I work with a lot of people at the Office of Management and Budget um, in, in my line of work. So it was really exciting uh, to see those references and those costing principles. And I, I don't know if uh, people in the outside world really appreciate how those costing principles really impact how they do. So it was that was really exciting. So um, uh, I thank you for for presenting us with this report. It it it, it made uh, for it was fun to read. So thank you so much. It sounds like uh, you're going to be on, on my list to interview next year, I think, Michael. Maybe. <laughs> and I know the compliance supplements, yeah, in our line of work, we've been worried about the compliance supplements coming out, and they were they were quite large this year. Um, and uh, understanding how you deal with the CARES Act funding um, and, and the audit uh, risk that we at, at an institution like UC or even for a public school, uh, the real risk that we have to, to, to think about. And um, it's been a lot of information uh, to make sense of. So uh, thank you for tackling it for us. Anybody else? Michael might be excited about it. I think for the rest of us, it's a little bit of a chore to go through it in all honesty. And we tend to turn all the way back to the findings page and try to get, uh, and it's like reading the last page of the thriller novel to see uh, what actually you had to say about us, but uh, it obviously represents a huge amount of work. So thank you very much for that. Uh, this is an action item to approve this audit. I would make That's a motion a prompt. that we approve it. Thank you, Michael. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you, Dolly. Are there any other comments or questions? Hearing none, uh, we'll move to a vote. Uh, Trustee Whitaker. Ah, uh, pardon me. I got to stop again. Shane, our student rep, your preferential vote, please. Yes. And my apologies. Yes, thank you. Trustee Whitaker. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Kuziak. Yes. Trustee Adams. Yes. Vice President Theodore. Yes. And mine's yes, so it's approved five to zero. Thank you very much, Peter. We move on, we still have you, I assume, for uh, item C, the bond performance audit report. So we'll be glad to hear about that one as well. Great, thank you again. So um, this is specifically in regards to measure G, um, which is within the building fund, um, the most active part of the building fund. And so this, this audit report deals with a financial uh, piece and also performance audit. So um, it's a much shorter looking report, and, um, but there is a substantial amount of work that goes into it. 
So as you as you look through that report, that reports on your um, your financial position as of June 30th of 2020, uh, goes into the, the spending of the year. And, and again, as I had mentioned in the other uh, report, your capital outlay. Uh, so that's really reflected here in this uh, particular audit. And um, so in this particular audit, we test the expenditures. We also test contracts, change orders, and things of that nature. And then we make sure that, you know, if we run into any of those things, uh, specifically change orders, you know, if there's substantiation, if there's a percentage allowed um, and board approval, and we make sure that contracts go out to bid, that you know they're they're being fairly bid, and um, so at the end of the day, uh, with Measure G, we didn't find any exceptions. Uh, we cited a few uh, references to public contract code that we that we use to, you know, for some of our testing there in, in the last couple of bullets on on page uh, 15. Uh, we tested about 45 percent of the invoices paid, uh, quantity-wise, 12.8 million. And um, so again, in, in all that testing, we didn't find any exceptions. And um, so our, we gave you a clean opinion and uh, no exceptions on the bond measure audit. Yeah, thank you for that. It's uh, once again, it's really a, a joy to hear that there are no exceptions and no findings and this one's particularly important, although you say it's it's maybe smaller than the other audit, but nevertheless, the community entrusted us with a lot of money and we uh, really enjoy hearing that an outside opinion that we are actually spending it appropriately and keeping a good track of it. So thank you for that. Are there any comments by anybody on, on the bond audit? Arvind, did you wanna have any comment about the auditing overall? Um, no, I just have to say I am so grateful to have such an amazing team. I was going to say um, when Peter was talking about the availability of our staff, that's because they've been on site since day one, since March. And um, that probably isn't the case everywhere. So it makes it a lot easier. And then we've got just awesome people in charge, Susie and Trish and all of their team, the business division. Thank you. That's terrific. So uh, thanks a lot. Uh, this again is an action item to accept or- approval of the audit report for the bond. Thank you. Thank you, Lavender. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, we'll go to a vote and I'll ask for Shane's preferential vote. Yes. And Trustee Whitaker. Yes. Trustee Cusiak. Yes. Trustee Adams? Yes. Vice President Theodore? Yes. And my vote is yes, so that is also approved five to nothing. So thank you very much, uh, Peter. We appreciate your help with all of this. And uh, I think it's great to, that we have such a great partnership in going over this uh, and completing this task. It's really important to us to, to do it and uh, even if you were to find negative things, it would still be important for us to know that, but I'm really pleased that you didn't find any, so that's terrific. So thank you very much. Thank you everyone, have a good night and stay well. Thank you. So we'll move on to item 10D, the bond financing program overview. Yeah, this is an exciting presentation that Susie's gonna lead us in. Um, it's it's a bit long, but I think the information in it is really, really important for us. Yes, so, so we do have um, a presentation for you tonight. This is information um, uh, in preparation for our upcoming uh, bond sale. As you know, uh, our Measure G, this, which is the, the audit that, we, that uh, Peter and Glenn just reviewed, um, we, this is now, um, you know, we're looking at selling the last series of our Measure G bonds and this year's C. Uh, for $33 million. So Blake uh, from um, KN uh, Public Finance will go through the presentation. He will um, uh, give you highlights on where we are uh, as far as uh, our outstanding debt uh, uh, summary, um, the assessed value, 
as well as a couple of refundings, and he will go uh, over that. Um, uh, one of one being the geo uh, uh, geo bond, and also the uh, other refunding is the uh, certificates of um, participation. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Blake. Good, good evening, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Well, it, it's always nice to follow when we're talking about the next phase and, and really final phase of Measure G. It's nice to follow a presentation from the auditor that everything has uh, been spent well and, and has gone well uh, associated with the Measure G. Um, really, this is an information discussion tonight in advance of what we're currently planning to bring as an action item next month on the 10th. Uh, for the board to consider approval of the final series of Measure G bonds. And so I have some information uh, just to um, share, uh, you know, leading up to that board meeting. Um, Susie, what's the best? Should I just tell you when to move to the next slide or? Okay. Yeah, just say next slide. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, just as a, a starting point, a quick review of the district's uh, overall bond program uh, where community members have approved three bond measures uh, over the last nearly 20 years, authorizing um, uh, 183.8 million. Um, the 2002 being the oldest measure and 2005 measures have all since been uh, issued um, and money spent really with Measure G being the active uh, program uh, where out of the $123 million authorized, the district has currently sold 90 million, leaving 33 million left to be sold. And that's what we'll be focused on uh, for today's discussion. The table at the bottom just summarizes uh, all of the different series of bonds that are currently outstanding. And you can see there's only the series A and B of measure G outstanding um, in the amount of just over 75 million. And everything associated with the two prior measures has since been refunded for purposes of generating taxpayer savings. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit tonight too, as it relates to an opportunity to save additional monies for taxpayers. Uh, next slide. And then also just as we get started, just as a uh, as an update, um, some board members may know this, others may not, um, but uh, the county has released the latest assessed value for the district, the 2021 AV. There continues to be um, extremely strong um, AV growth. This last year, uh, the district reached over 9.6 billion, by far the largest um, valuation uh, the district has seen. Uh, in history, and that represents over a 5% growth year over year. Uh, you can see in the graph kind of how uh, each annual growth is represented. Um, and then the table at the very top looks at incremental growth trends um, in a 5, 10, 15, 20, and 25 year term. And you can see just focusing on the longest term, the 25 year, the district having had annual growth uh, on average uh, of 5.35%. So, um, you know, absolutely a, a, a benefit as it pertains to general obligation bonds. And I'll point out that when Measure G was passed, the growth assumption was a very conservative 3%. And so when we see the strong growth that the district has had, the result is a lower tax rate that taxpayers are actually paying than what they authorized on the ballot. Uh, next slide. I think we're having a little trouble with our speaker. At least I am. Yes. Can you hear me okay, Susie? Next slide. Yeah. I can hear you. Yeah. Can you guys hear me okay? We can hear you now. Yes. I think he keeps going in and out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so quickly, I, I know that everyone um, 
most most folks on this uh, uh, meeting know the great accomplishments that Measure G has had, um, and we wanted to highlight them here before we look at the next phase um, and just look at uh, what the Series A and Series B issuances have accomplished. Again, that was uh, it at a 53 million and 37 million uh, amounts uh, for the bond sale. Uh, both sales are aligned in terms of their final maturity, which is 2046. I've already mentioned the 3% annual growth rate. And then really the, the, the nicest thing I think on this slide is um, uh, the pictures down at the bottom and simply just what's been accomplished. Um, we're talking about the building 400 at the high school, um, uh, modular buildings that were um, uh, installed at the adult and career ed um, location, and then a variety of projects at the district's elementary school sites. So really some great uh, flagship projects that have been accomplished already through Measure G. Um, on to the next slide, we'll start focusing really, which is the last series of Measure G bonds to be sold in the amount of 33 million uh, to address ongoing and current capital facility projects. Uh, this bond issuance is structured to really mirror what the Series A and so it will have a short term than those prior series because we're aligning it again with that 2046 3% annual AV growth assumption. And in the and, and you can see in the graph in those gray bars, that's really representative of the debt service for the Series C issuance and how when it's stacked along with the Series A and B, where the ultimate tax rate is expected to remain, which is right about dollars per hundred thousand. So notably less than what voters approved, which was $60 per 100,000 for Measure G. And then some of the, uh, some of the assumptions, um, we remain in a low interest rate environment. So this sale is expected um, to generate a borrowing cost uh, of under two and a half percent. We're currently estimating about 2.37 and, and correspondingly a very low overall repayment ratio of about 1.4 to one. So are there any are, are there any questions? I'll pause there on the Series C uh, issuance structure um, and concept for the new money sale that's being planned. Um, no, but I, I do um, I do want to say I think it's really important for everyone to hear that um, if you go back to the, the page before we talked about our um, our credit rating. Um, and all of the things that you were talking about that we've been talking about all count when we go out to sell our bonds. You know, how stable the district is and the, and the fact that the prices of homes have gone up um, continuously. And um, the page that you were on, I think it's really important when we were, you know, um, talking to our community about passing the bond measure and we were saying $60 per 100,000, the fact that it's actually not 60 per 100,000, I think is, is another um, indication of, um, of how well it's going. And I remember when we sold our last bonds, it was, it was just really great to see so many people interested that day. Mike. Yeah, I just for my benefit as a new board member and for the public as well. So when I look, look at the schedule here, um, is this telling me um, when we issue the bonds, we're, we're going to get like a big check for like 33 uh, million bucks to do the things that we need to do. And then each year, we're obligated to pay those amounts uh, back from our general funds, right? That, that's, that's what that's telling you. That's correct. It's, it's, it's a repayment uh, of that borrow. It's a borrowed money, the 33 million borrowed from future property tax payments. And that borrowing will, will consist of a 26 year term. And you can see how incrementally the, the borrowing is paid down along with uh, the interest costs associated with the borrowing. And we can also assume over time that our, our budget's probably growing in some ways 
in relative dollars, right? So yeah, but Michael, it's not paid back from our general fund and has nothing to do with our budget. It's sorry, paid back sorry. with property tax. Yeah. Sorry. I just want to be clear. Thank you. thank you for clarifying. Sorry. No problem. Do you have any other question, Mike? Is that was that it? Okay. Thanks. Uh, Blake, go ahead. Thank you. And uh, Superintendent brings up a great point just as it relates to the implementation throughout the Measure G program, which is really representative of strong fiscal stewardship and securing and, and managing the district, securing strong ratings and securing the lowest possible cost of borrowing. So along those lines, if we move to the next slide, Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, moving to the next slide, um, we find ourselves in a very low interest rate environment. And district staff, along with the bond financing team, have been evaluating potential refinancing opportunities in an effort to generate further taxpayer savings. And if you bring your eyes down to the bottom right, you can see just how low, relative to the last 20 years, our current interest rates are at uh, compared to prior years. And so with this very low interest rate environment and, and being near historically low interest rate levels, we see that there's a series of bonds, the 2012 refunding bonds. So they've already been refunded once, are coming up as a, uh, a strong and viable refunding candidate that can generate what we are currently estimating to be over $570,000 of lower interest cost for taxpayers. And the way that that's generated is the, the average borrowing cost or interest rate on those outstanding bonds is about 4.92%. And we compare that to what we're currently estimating the interest cost would be on a refinancing at about 1.31%. And so with that lower cost of borrowing, it reduces the annual amount taxpayers would, would pay in interest. And, there, and that's what's generating the $570,000 worth of savings. Now, to the point made earlier, general obligation bonds um, are not paid for uh, nor um, associated with the district's general fund. And so the savings would be directly for taxpayers. There is no fiscal impact to the district whatsoever. I'll pause there and see if there's any questions regarding the general obligation refinancing or refunding bonds. Yeah, Su Susie and I, um, Susie and I were talking about the fact that why this is just the right time to do this if, when we bring it back, the board approves. Um, is each time you go out to refinance, obviously there's a cost. Um, so this time it actually, you know, since we're doing it at the same time, it's it's working to our benefit. Um, so if you want to say anything about that, Susie. Yeah, um, yeah, so um, that, that, like what you, um, Ms. Amadi said, just looking at your uh, selling the bonds, um, our Series C that uh, Blake um, kind of covered, and also with this uh, um, uh, refunding opportunity for uh, one of our GO bonds. And then I know that he's going to cover the last page, which is the, the COP, is doing that all together really. Um, um, there, there is a benefit to us in terms of the, um, doing it all at the same time rather than one at a time just because of the cost of issuance and all of the other costs associated with going through this process. And so I know that, you know, uh, uh, Blake uh, is, uh, uh, worked on making sure, and also the rest of the team, right? Um, we have a couple of uh, underwriters and also our bond council to make sure that the cost of issuance is at, you know, at a minimum, like, you know, we try to make sure that, that we're not um, spending uh, or, or, you know, uh, any, any, any other um, costs uh, that's associated, it's at the uh, as a minimum. So, and that's what we're trying to achieve uh, for all of these uh, refundings as well as the, the bond sale. Got it. And, and 
I didn't actually have a question. I just felt like it needed to be said again that it's great that we have an opportunity to um, to do this at no cost and, and save our taxpayers some money. Um, so thanks. You know, I will also say that we've done this a couple of times in the past few years and saved actually more than this. This is a half a million dollars roughly, which is a very good savings. But I think in the past it's been multiple yeah. millions mm -hmm. that have been saved from the, that the taxpayers in Castro Valley do not have to pay. Yes. I remember and, and a number I, like 7 million or something like that. Mm -hmm. and, and a couple things that I'll point out uh, relative to the amount of savings uh, that we're currently estimating. Um, the amount of savings is direct, directly related to the amount of bonds that can actually be refunded. And so uh, right now, um, you know, we're looking at there's there's not a large amount of general obligation uh, general obligation bonds that can be refunded. Um, the amount, uh, as you can see in this table, um, is just under seven million dollars. And so the the half so <clears throat> currently correspond to that amount of uh, bonds that we could refund. Yeah, Blake, I wouldn't want you to think that I don't, don't appreciate the half a million. I think that's terrific. And it's really good that we've got that, those other bonds down so far. You know, they're almost paid off. So that's the reason it's not a very, as big as it has been in the past. But all of that's good news. So thanks. Yeah, I would echo uh, that sentiment and, uh, you know, uh, board leadership have really represented what it means to be strong fiscal stewards of taxpayer dollars, not only what we're currently discussing as a 2021 financing effort, but what's been done in past as well. I think so Dolly, had a excuse me, Blake, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I think Dolly has a question for you. Okay. Oh, um, I don't have a question. I just wanted to say that I think it is really, really good that um, you're passing, uh, that we're able to pass the savings on to the Castro Valley taxpayer. I think that's a terrific thing. Yeah. Great. Thank you. So moving on to the next page and a lines of taking advantage of the low interest rate environment, there is also an opportunity through this multi-series financing to actually benefit the district's general fund by refinancing the outstanding 2011 certificates of participation that were, that were originally sold uh, for the construction and installation of solar energy generating facilities uh, at certain school sites. Uh, now, these, these bonds are directly tied to the district's general fund and were originally sold as a way of reducing the annual energy cost burden on the general fund. And that's what substantiated um, the, the process to move forward at that time. Now, any reduction in costs that we can realize now is just an added benefit. We already are seeing the impact of the energy facility um, savings and by reducing the cost now, we are estimating that the general fund can save over the remaining life of these bonds, uh, approximately a million dollars. And so again, relative to the size of bonds that can be refunded, which is under 500, I'm sorry, under $5 million, we're talking about saving in interest cost alone about a million dollars, which is quite significant. And so the table to the right really breaks down how those savings equate on an annual basis over the remaining life of this repayment term. So it's not a million dollars all in one given year, but we're talking about in the range of 80 to $90,000 a year as a benefit to the, to the district general fund, which is quite sizable. And the way that, similar to the geo bond refinancing, the way that we're able to capture the savings is by refinancing the existing bonds, which have an interest cost of about 4.91% and reducing it down to what's available in the current market, 
which we are estimating at about 1.539%. So a significant reduction in interest cost. Arvind, did you have a comment or question? Yeah, um, I, I think this is, it's really important that people see the distinction between this and a geo bond because this was basically in 2011, I know we have some, um, a couple of new board members. In 2011, in order to actually build and construct the, um, the solar panels and all of those, we had to, the district had to borrow money and, uh, and pay with interest. So that was about $10 million. And now, I mean, this is huge savings and this is actually general fund. Um, but what I also want to mention is, as you walk around now um, through Measure G, I just have to say I am so proud of our team um, because there are solar panels going up where um, for to make shade um, and all of that. None of that we have to borrow money for. We're actually using uh, Measure G as we were supposed to and also applying for all sorts of things that we qualify for for energy efficiency and things like that. So I just wanted to give a, uh, give a shout out to Susie and Sharon and their team. Uh, Michael. Yeah, uh, why is it called a certificate of participation? How is that, can you <laughs> distinguish that for me uh, compared to a bond? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so a, cert a certificate of participation uh, is a form of non-voter approved debt that is available and widely used by school districts throughout the state. Uh, so it, it's uh, far different than a general obligation bond that's approved by voters um, and repaid by property taxes. Uh, a COP or certificate of participation um, is uh, a, a financing or borrowing uh, that a school district can execute to move forward with various capital facility projects or, or other uses as solar facilities as well um, that is repaid by the general fund over the period of time. And it's quite a complex structure in terms of form and documentation. It's a, uh, it's a lease facility structure where the district actually puts up one of its existing facilities um, to a corporation and then leases that facility back in the form of annual lease payments, which in, in essence are the debt payments. Um, and so you'll see the different set of documents that are provided to the board at the March agenda, which will be far different uh, for the COPs than they are for the GEO bonds. And going back to the point that was made earlier, the reason that this is being brought forward in a multi-series, multi-financing type structure is solely for the opportunity to not only capture low interest costs in the current market, but also from a cost savings perspective. There's a tremendous economies of scale by going through this process all at the same time for all of these financings. And so while I'll apologize in advance that the agenda items next month are gonna be, I think there's gonna be more than one and there's gonna be a variety of documents associated with each, there's a rationale for it. And hopefully through the course of this presentation, the board gets a better understanding of that rationale and benefit. Yeah, can, I'd like to make, that's great. Uh, and I think it's terrific that you're working this out, uh, but I do want to make one other point about the uh, solar panels that were put up some years ago. And that is they cost us in financing about 300,000 plus dollars a year, but that is offset by the fact that we're off the grid at a number of campuses. So um, in a strange way, even though we have to pay 300,000 out of the general fund, we have saved around 400,000 out of the general fund for reduced energy costs at all those campuses. But the fact that you're gonna reduce it through this mechanism by another 50 to $80,000 a year is really pretty amazing, I think. So I'm really interested in seeing what you've got next month. I think that'll be, that's really exciting. Arvind? Yeah, I was gonna say, I'm so glad you said that because um, I think uh, when at one point I can't, it wasn't this year, but I think last year 
we were looking at something and I think Susie had a chart showing how much we are saving with solar panels that we had and now how much more we would be saving um, with the solar panels. And again, remember now we have added a whole bunch of air conditioning um, systems all over the place. So there, we had to think about that. So I, I think it's a really, really smart move. It was a smart move when they did it. Um, and it's, it's now, you know, we don't even have to really borrow money um, to do that, it, a, you know, just separate from what we ha already have. So, but um, trustee uh, Kuziak's question is a, is a great question because everyone says, what, what do, why do they call it certificate of participation? What are we participating in? It's just, you know, it, it's, a, it's a loan. Yeah. So, so the last bit of information in this presentation is just the tentative financing timeline looking forward. And following this evening's informational discussion, uh, we would plan to uh, submit and bring back, and, and uh, oh, Susie, you got, the, you got the schedule updated. Thanks so much. I, I was jotting down notes here to, to correct this. Um, so on February 10th, the board will um, uh, have an opportunity to uh, consider approval of each of these different financings uh, as they have their own respective benefit and uses. Um, and following it, should the board uh, authorize the financings, um, we would look to post the official statement, our pre preliminary official statement, which is kind of like the prospectus of these bonds to the investor community. And we're, we're actually delaying doing that to make sure that we have the latest and greatest uh, uh, financial reports available to the marketplace. And so while the district is considering approval February 10th, we would actually wait until March 11th to post the preliminary official statement, which would then put us in a position to secure interest rates on March 18th and close the transaction on April 1st. When we close the transaction, the Measure G proceeds, the 33 million will be deposited and available for future facility projects and uh, the respective escrow accounts to refinance the old bonds will be funded. So those bonds in a sense will be off the district's books and the new lower cost interest bonds will now be um, really what the district and taxpayers uh, would be paying moving forward. Between now and then, there are lots and there's a lot of work that Susie does. There's also, there's some meetings that Susie and I have to attend to, um, you know, to speak about our school district and, and why we're, you know, it would be great for people to invest in us. Any other questions for Blake? Comments? Well, Blake, you know, I have to say, terrific presentation. Uh, lots of good news, I think, and actually quite exciting. Um, you know, I don't usually say that about financing things. <laughs> usually not that exciting, but this is actually really good news. And Thank Blake you. can come, you, Blake, you can come here next time when you present so you have better internet. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, I, yeah, I, I'm so sorry for the for the choppy um, internet, but uh, I'd love to. I would love to go there and see all you in person. I can't wait. We all suffer from President that choppy Howard, internet. We have one, one comment. We have one, one public speaker. comment. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, bring that person on, please. Welcome, Yoko. You're still muted though. Oops. Uh, Yoko seems to have disappeared. Must have been an accident then. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> okay, so there's no one else who wants to speak there in the public? No, that was the only public comment. Okay. Nothing, anything else from the board? Well, once again, Blake, I think 
a very good news presentation. So thank you very much for waiting through most of our meeting to speak to us and uh, we look forward to hearing from you at our next meeting. Thanks so much. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you, Blake. Okay, move on to an update of our Measure G projects. Uh, Sharon, welcome, Sharon. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, we have a pattern here of um, all of our reports we, from the audit, the bond performance report to the bond financing uh, sale. And now it's the Measure G. So just to give you an update on where we are, what we've been doing the last uh, the last time, since the last time you um, Sharon presented. And so uh, again, we're really happy um, uh, to have Sharon with us uh, tonight to present. And also um, just congratulate the team for doing uh, an amazing uh, uh, job with you know uh, the audit, with uh, all of the uh, 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 documents um, that were um, submitted to our uh, our auditors for review, and so so again, um, as uh, was presented earlier, a clean audit. So I, I want to thank Sharon and their team for do, doing such an amazing job, and um, so and the work will keep going with a, a, a thirty three million dollars more of um, of uh, uh, funding for for uh, construction projects. So. Sharon, you want to go ahead? Yes, I want to start. Um, yeah, thank you for um, everyone for all your support. Um, I think it's, it makes it so much easier to do work. Um, so Amy, next slide, please. I know I'm the last presentation, so I'll um, also try to keep it brief too. Um, so, you know, just an update of what we've been doing. Uh, we have CVE, our library, you know, for all our classrooms, library, science spaces, we've been going through you know, a few of them on each site um, over the last four years now um, doing renovations. So with the interior renovations, you know, just a sample of what we do, interior painting, new flooring. So we generally try to put the carpet into um, the libraries. And this is um, actually a newer material where it's more of a rubber flooring with um, a fiber on it. So it's, um, it, it doesn't, um, it actually keeps the moisture in there. It doesn't let it seep into the subfloor. Uh, we go and repair the ceilings. We've gone and done LED lighting and um, window film on uh, the windows for uh, reflectiveness and safety. And uh, we've gone through and done the HVAC. And next slide, please. So another shot of the library and, um, you know, so next, please. And then for the multi-purpose room, we also go and do the floors. This is an LVT floor, luxury vinyl tile floor. Um, uh, we also do the, uh, the window blinds in the library and the classroom too. And here in the multi-purpose room, if you look on um, the blinds, we actually motorize them so that um, it can be kind of moved up and down if they have performances or have like, movie or something that they're showing for the kids. Um, new painting and uh, next slide. Uh, so, you know, we, we've, we've talked about with the COP and the, sol the existing solar that was at um, three of the sites. We have been um, actively putting new solar that's at uh, most of the elementary schools. Um, and this helps to uh, offset the operation costs for all the new AC. So we really looked at how to um, efficiently spend the bond funds, both with our first cost and also looking at operation costs and whatever we're putting in. Like for solar, making sure that, you know, we are um, cognizant that there's general fund dollars that we'll spend to operate the new AC and also with flooring that uh, we choose a floor that's very low maintenance, that it's, uh, with four operations, they don't have to wax it. Um, and also in terms of use of spaces, we look at uh, where are good spaces within the school and the site to put uh, things like that, to get a multi-use out of them. That um, we're you know, reaping the benefits of solar power, but wherever we can, we try to put in an area that also doubles as a shade structure. Like this one's on the side of the playground at um, Castro Valley um, Elementary. 
So uh, next slide. Independent. Um, this is actually um, one of the spots that we weren't able to find like a dual purpose on. Um, so this ended up being a ground mount that's kind of way on kind of the side of the hill behind the portables. Um, but what we're able to do if we couldn't make a multi-use out of this, that we save some money in terms of the structure. So like if we didn't have to put it on um, some beams and um, columns, we can save some money and, uh, and we do that. And it's out of the way. And this, you know, you really don't see it too much unless you're really, we had, we had to go and get that shot pretty well. So uh, next slide. I'm, I'm just curious, how do you make sure people don't climb on it? Oh, it is fenced. Yeah, this is um, this is not an area that is supposed to be open to the public. <laughs> uh, and, uh, let's see, moving on. So this slides for um, independent. Also, um, another shot of um, what we do for the multi-purpose room, similar to CVE. This is um, before we put down the floor so that we've, um, we've ripped out the old floor, we've done, um, sometimes we have to do a moisture barrier. This is the leveling compound and um, prepping the floor for uh, the new tile that will go on and they've already repainted. So next slide. Um, so more solar, there's, there's a bunch of solar um, here. We've uh, been able to finish most of them that were just waiting for the final connection with PG&E, so a Jensen um, that one we were able to put on the side of the field between the field and the schoolyard. Next slide. Uh, Proctor also. And wherever we can, we look at also with the site if they might want to come back and either uh, gain more of asphalt space for their yard under the shade struck, I mean, under their solar slash shade, um, or just keep it as grass. So that's something we look at with the site too. Um, next slide. And some of the classroom interiors. Um, so this is classroom 16 through 20. Um, kind of the, the same kind of flooring, um, window blinds, painting, ceilings, um, lights that we've done. And, um, and we act, what we've done also is try to standardize the materials that we picked. So you've probably seen the same floor throughout a lot of the other pictures is that we also want to make it easier later if um, there is um, some maintenance cost that's like, oh, this is the color that we use for all of our sites. And um, you know, for paint, for floor, um, and then even on the exterior painting, we try to keep it to a certain number of colors so it's easier for maintenance later. Um, next slide. And um, with the interior work, we also worked for these particular buildings at Proctor. Um, we had really looked at the drainage um, issues that was around because there's a lot of water intrusion um, that were, uh, were seen and also like uh, the, the users had told us about. So we spent a lot more time in looking at what needed to change and um, reworking the landscape and the drainage and moving water away from the building as we look at um, you know, what, what we need to do to repair any dry rot or um, you know, any of the work that needs to be done. So this is kind of us um, trying to dig down, removing a lot of the um, dirt that's around because um, some of the drains were like trying to move uphill against gravity and it's hard for water to do that. Um, so next slide. And it starts to, as we clear, you know, we create um, what they call the drainage swales, like in these concrete, almost V ditches that they're pouring. Um, the old ones were starting to crack with a lot of the tree roots that were um, getting into it. So we're redoing a lot of those. And um, we did have to take a couple of trees down. We tried to leave as much as we can. Um, worked with the site on that. Uh, next slide. Um, then Marshall, we uh, repainted the exterior of the multi-purpose room and we um, did the interior last year. So um, next slide. Uh, Stanton, we, um, this is the exterior painting. So we've um, done multiple schools at this time. So we're working on Stanton, kind of similar um, in colors 
I think that this is the kind of same red as Canyon with the uh, next slide. So then a couple more shots of the campus and the painting that's in progress. The next slide. And uh, with this, we also like with the, the glass block that's on kind of the upper stories of um, some of the classrooms here, we looked at uh, repairing and sealing those as we're working on the exterior. So um, not just painting, we look at like whatever is in, um, that needs to be repaired or that's damaged, we work on like fixing everything as we're making everything look pretty also. Um, so next slide. But you're not removing them, right? No. Oh, yeah. But what they had was they had this plastic, like plexiglass over them. Um, and we removed it and looked at what was the issue and then sealed it. So it, it's not as much of an eyesore. Uh, so uh, Vinoy, uh, this is kind of the side of the track. This is where we're putting in or uh, the solar. So just kind of a shot of um, during construction of them working. So next slide. Uh, and then this is just uh, some paving, asphalt paving and concrete work that we did in front in the front lot of Vinoy and expanding um, kind of the sidewalk, that upper right, you know, upper left picture, kind of the strip of um, walkway that leads to the front. We expanded that a little bit um, just so it gives a little more room for the kids when they're back. Next slide. Um, the interior of the multi-purpose room similar to the other ones. Um, and next one. And lastly, for the high school, we've, we've kind of gone and done some painting. This is the side of the library. So just kind of going around and seeing what needs to be done and kind of taking care of those um, things. And um, next one. So we get to kind of finally our financials. Um, I mean, no, we've been we've been talking about financials with the audit and the refunding. So this is kind of us uh, to date um, as of um, December thirty first. Um, column this I usually show this one pager of just a very general overview of how we're doing in the program. Um, and column A is all of our ex expenses to date from beginning of time till um, end of December. And we've uh, we spent 85.6 million. And uh, column B encumbered is how much we have in contracts right now. Um, and that's about 7.9 million. Uh, C is our furniture budget. So there are specifics in the implementation plan on the furniture and the technology. And those two columns in C and D are broken down. So furniture, that's what's left. We've done a big pushed in the last year to get the um, 21st century furniture and working with the schools to kind of develop the standards and see what they really need. Um, so this is actually what's left over. Um, a lot of it's with the high school and the middle schools um, because we're rolling that out slowly versus the elementary schools have, um, have gotten most of their furniture. And there might be a couple of sites that decided to do like maybe a two phase um, so that's what's left in furniture. And technology, we have actually done pretty much most of our technology upgrade at this time. So this um, column D is actually kind of a breakout of the, from expenses. So from column A, um, this is specific, like 4.1 million has been spent on technology, which is really the infrastructure with um, upgrading our data, networking, all the cabling, all the switches, the fiber um, that goes through our server rooms and um, our wireless access points. So that's what that expense is. And um, E is kind of our total remaining budget that we're working with at this point. Um, F is our total budget when you kind of add everything up. That's the um, 149.2 million. That's kind of what we have as our our kind of full capital um, improvement budget. And we have um, column G and H are the percentage completed versus the percentage remaining. And um, I think we're pretty on target for all of the different schools and currently we are still on budget. 
And um, the next slide, please, that'll be our final slide. I wanted to um, kind of revisit like where our 149 uh, million is because our bond is 123. You know, that's what voters have voted on. But the whole capital project um, or program, as we'd say, our building program, um, comes together from a lot of different building uh, funds. We have our Measure G, which is uh, you know a bulk of the money, but we also are uh, been working very heavily on maximizing our state funding and reimbursement. And Prop 51 passed about the same time, and so we've been able to get in line for um, 11.4 million from the state that we are expecting in this next few years, and we've been able to get uh, Prop. 39, which is energy savings uh, funds. And we have our developer fees that we have some that we've used for the wellness center and we're projecting more that's coming in. We have a routine, routine restricted maintenance that is um, comes from the general fund budget every year. And then um, fund 20 will 210 and fund three, um, 35 really, that is our existing building funds. Um, what I also wanted to highlight um, so all that, you know, adds up to the 149 million and that, um, you know, I want to highlight that we are always kind of looking at what additional funds or grants and state funding we can get. So uh, we are looking at another, at least 12.2 um, million beyond the Prop 51, because we know that we are prepping, the state is prepping for another state, for, uh, another state bond in 2022. And that is, um, my presentation, any questions? Any questions or comments, Dot? And then Lavender. Thank you. Um, that was, uh, I really appreciate that presentation, Sharon. It was very thorough and I loved seeing all of the pictures of all of the campuses. Um, I, and I also wanted to comment about how appreciative I am of the thoughtfulness that went into the solar panels and, mul and multi-use of those um, shade S shade structures and to power the HVAC systems that were put in. Uh, you mentioned the Prop 51 funding, um, probably, or you said something that didn't sound like we were for sure getting uh, eleven million dollars. Uh, so, can can you talk about that a little? Oh no, um, we are getting that eleven million. Okay. Okay. Because Maybe I misheard you. It sounded like it wasn't a sure thing. And I just wanted to make sure that we weren't going to be on the hook for $11 million. Oh, no, that, that, is, a, that okay. is a sure thing. Okay. It is, um, it is um, just a matter of time of okay. the state processing our application and, um, and reimbursing us. OK, um, then I probably just misunderstood you. Thank yeah. you. But the, it, it made my heart skip a beat a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> But, but I think um, it's important to remember, remember there was a bond um, on the last, in November that didn't pass. That was another one that we were hoping for. And now there may be another one and other opportunities. So that's besides the 11 million. So there, we, when it comes up, we're gonna really have to do our part to support it. Um, so that if it gets passed, then there's more opportunity for us to ask for more than what we have. Mm -hmm. So, um, and maybe it's when I was talking about the, the last line on yeah. the 12.2 million, because I mean, they're kind of close, um, because that is how the state program works is you continue to submit applications of the project. So we take a project that we're doing like the 100 building was like $2 million. So we take that, we submit it as an application. It's like we spent $2 million on the high school for this. And, you know, we have eligibility. We want to stand in line for funding. And the state continues to take applications even after they've exhausted their bonding authority. Even it goes into another pot, but you kind of, you just stand in line until um, the coffers replenish so that, um, you know, that is application we're working on and that we're getting into the state so that it's just a matter if uh, when that next bond passes, then that will come. It's just, that is kind of more so, uh, we don't know exactly which year that will come. Like the first 11 million, we've been able to kind of plot out like based on um, the OPSC is the uh, agency that processes that 
based on how many applications we see them working on, like we think we're gonna get the money in like a year and in two years and in three years. Lavender. I just wanted to comment on um, the continued commitment to sustainable principles um, and the way that you're planning out the Measure G projects. I don't know how many of you saw today that um, President Biden came out stating that global climate change is you know, something that's damaging us and that we need to work towards it. And I'm really honored to be at a district that's already working on it. I mean, from reducing impacts to the film that we're using to um, energy efficiency lighting to, um, you know, even thinking about the, the paint colors that we're using that are consistent, that's gonna reduce um, using more products or having to manufacture more products. So just your continued commitment and also your application and utilization of our grants and rebates that not only save us money, but they help us be able to complete those sustainable projects. And I know that's such a big thing for our community. I'm just really proud to say that our community not only is saving money, but helping protect the environment. Michael? It's really exciting to be on the other end of this, knowing uh, that we are a part of the Measure G team to get this passed. And uh, Sharon, thank you so much. I uh, appreciate the efficiency with 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 which you with which you work, and um, you're very nimble. I, I really appreciate that. Uh, I, I just want to make a shout out and thanks to those who might be listening and to the all of our uh, board oversight members. Uh, that's a critical component uh, of this, and it's important that uh, people know that there's great ways to be involved with your school district. And one of them is being on the Measure G Oversight Board. Thank you for their work. Um, I wanted to just ask during this time of idle time of our students uh, not being in our campuses, I should say, um, have we been able to use that in our favor to, to speed up work and to get things done? Uh, yes, we've been able, I mean, in 2020, we've been able to get an immense amount of work done um, on our campuses. Um, I mean, it, it, it was kind of, a little unpredictable in the very beginning in terms of like what can and cannot be done. I think we got like one day off where we call off the contractors and we call them all back. Um, and um, the, the, you know, we we're able to be efficient to have the board um, pass the, uh, a resolution that allowed for construction to continue as an essential um, activity. And so that really helped us. And, you know, and what we also tried to do was um, not bite off more than we can chew to, we, we scheduled the work as like, okay, we're gonna do it um, in these little mini phases. It's like, we're gonna do this this month. And if we're still out, we're gonna do this next month. And, uh, you know, we're able to get all that in. Um, and, um, you know, this, this last quarter, we, we did kind of scale back a little bit because, you know, the teachers are back and, we, and with reopening and the surges, we, we wanted to give them more space. We, we um, and really work with the sites in terms of where they want us and where they don't want us. Um, and you know that's why we did a lot of exterior painting. We did solar so that we're outside. You know we're not bothering anybody. Um, and we do do some work inside whenever um, it is allowable because the teachers are still using their spaces. Holly. Um, I just wanted to concur with what uh, Lavender had said about the uh, how terrific it is really that those solar panels are going up all over the campuses and also are um, helping with our, our budget as well. I mean, they're like a, a you know, double du duty uh, good. <laughs> and it is also both for our state, which had the wildfires and for our country, you know, with the whole um, environmental global warming, it is great to see us be contributing to lessening our, um, our footprint. So terrific. Marvine. Yeah, I just, I mean, I, I can't thank Sharon and her team and Susie enough uh, because I, you get to see bond projects around the state and um, what was really done here isn't necessarily what's done everywhere. Um, and that resolution you passed really got us on the right track. 
um, thank you for that. I wanted to say, as I visit schools, it's just, it looks so everywhere. It looks so beautiful. Everything looks nice and ready for kids. And sometimes when I walk into a room, there's a teacher teaching online, but you know, all their furniture is nice and new. <laughs> um, so it, it's just great. I know that we're working on um, trying to put something together like a video for the community. But at some point when things get a little bit better and we're you know, maybe in red or orange or something like that, maybe we can do a socially distant caravan instead of the bus tour with CBOC to all of the sites. Because just, I, I walked on you know, to, um, I, would, I, I was at Vanoi and just the amphitheater is just gorgeous. Um, so just everything. So that might be something we want to plan later on with CBOC. Not. I was just thinking <laughs> how exciting it will be for our students after being away from their campuses for so long to get to go back to all of this newness and brightness. It's exciting. Yeah. Well, I'll just, uh, I'll close with a couple of comments here. And one is that I think, uh, even though we have time with the students not on the campuses and so forth, we should remember back a couple of years when there were sadly and tragically all those fires up in uh, Sonoma and so forth. And the ability to actually get contractors to come in and work for us was a significant challenge. And so I think it's really remarkable what you've been able to do in that environment for most of the, the period of Measure G. And the other thing I'll say is that I, I appreciate the fact that you mentioned that much of the work is in the walls and in the floor, because a lot of the money from Measure G is gonna be invisible to most people. They won't be able to see the underfloor and the, uh, um, and the wiring in the walls and so forth. So I think that's a, those are really important things, but they tend to disappear. And uh, mm -hmm. so thanks for highlighting those as well. Any last comments before we move on? I think I've, we had, I think I saw a person's hand raised, Amy. It was an accident, I think. Uh, they lowered their hand. They did, okay. Well, wanted to make sure they got an opportunity if they wanted to have it. So we'll move on then to uh, item 10F, approve the personnel report. This is an action item. I'll move to approve the personnel report as amended. Thank you. I'll second it. Thank you, Mike. Uh, is there any further discussion? Hearing none, uh, all, well, not all those in favor. Uh, Trustee Whitaker. Yes. Trustee Kiziak. Yes. Trustee Adams. Yes. Vice President Theodore. Yes. And I'll say yes, and that makes it five to zero. The personnel report is approved. I don't believe we have any public comments from what Amy just said. So we'll move on to the superintendent's report. I don't, I, or I don't really have any additional things, especially since it's getting late. So. Okay, great. The board member comments. Uh, Shane, do you have anything extra you wanna say? Yeah, just a few. And sorry, I got booted out. My computer totally died, but I'm back in the meeting. Um, I've just been working with CSBMA to get a vote on the board of California EDU, and I've been serving on the SEL advisory board. Good. Congratulations on that. Um, Trustee Whitaker. Yes. Uh, last Monday, I joined Parveen and Dolly uh, for our second installment of the um, a community Alliance book club on the book cast. So that was a very um, great meeting with the community. And it's nice to hear what people are learning and what they're experiencing and having good conversations in the community about that. And then we will have a community Alliance meeting next Wednesday um, that we will be participating in as, as well. Great. Trustee Kuziak. Yeah, first I just wanna thank Amy for bringing in a space heater. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> so uh, I did three things and I have two things, two comments I'd like to make. Uh, first, I wanted to uh, thank the Casarelli Educational Foundation for welcoming me, welcoming me to uh, their meeting. Uh, 
if there's anyone left on our call tonight, please, please uh, get involved with the Educational Foundation and the good work that they're doing for our community. I look forward to being a liaison to them and, and uplifting them and supporting them. I did attend the monthly check-in with the Alameda County Office of Education and Dr. Moss from the Alameda County Public Health Department. Uh, I, I've got to just say this is an amazing resource uh, for, for a new school board member, right, to understand the landscape of uh, the COVID-19 challenge we're facing. And it's a really fantastic opportunity to, to learn. Uh, it's disappointing about what's happening with vaccine distribution right now. Um, that, I think that was the most disheartening uh, uh, takeaway from that, um, but it, it's great to be informed, right? Uh, so I appreciated that. Uh, I also attended the uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, celebration. And I, I just wanna thank Dr. Ryman that was a fantastic program that was put together. I think, you know, when you, you, you consider how many students were involved and families, we probably had almost 200 folks there. Um, and just hearing the student voices uh, speak up during that event uh, was just so powerful. And I, I wanna, I'm proud of our district um, and, 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 and the commitment uh, to, to that celebration. Um, two quick comments. Uh, I, I think we need to acknowledge and we have as a board acknowledged, um, Monday starts Black History Month. Um, I was I was thinking about lift every voice and sing. I don't know if you've ever heard that. Uh, and I, I was just re reading through the lyrics, and I was reminded of the, of the sing sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun, let us march on till victory is won. And I, I just hope we can take this upcoming month uh, to, to reflect about our community, our commitment to our American history which is black history. Uh, and I also would be remiss to not acknowledge that today is International Holocaust Remembrance Day. Uh, it's when we remember uh, the over 6 million Jews, Roma, the Sinti, Slavs, disabled people, members of the LGBTQ community, and many more who were killed by the Nazi regime. I was really moved by reading President Biden's um, statement today. Um, and I just wanted to share this. He said, the, Holoca the Holocaust was no accident of history. It occurred because too many governments bloodedly adopted and implemented hate-fueled laws, policies, and practices to vilify and dehumanize entire groups of people, and too many individuals stood by silently. Silence is complete. That thing. Thank you, Mike. Those are good comments. I appreciate them. Uh, I see Jason has his hand raised, I think, and I'd like to call on him if he's, or am I misinterpreting Jason? No, I didn't have my hand raised intentionally, but but uh, I appreciated that really thoughtful uh, reflection on uh, the Black National Anthem, Lift Every Voice and Sing, and as well as Holocaust Remembrance Day. Thank you. Well, strangely, I see Jer Sherry with a hand raised. Is that another, uh, am I hallucinating here? And Susie, there must be something going on here because I'm seeing hands raised all over the place. Maybe their hands were uh, yeah, of applause for what Michael said. That's great. So, uh, Trustee Adams. Um, yes. Um, so I have uh, like five activities that I have um, participated in. Uh, <laughs> as uh, Lavender had said, the Community Alliance for the book cast. Um, I was able to go to, um, excuse me, part of that meeting. And um, it was very good. I mean, the, the uh, discussions with people are enlightening and enjoyable. And I really like that group. I will be going to the Community Alliance meeting next Wednesday for sure. I did go to the uh, Martin Luther King celebration as well. Uh, and I was able to observe that. It was, um, it was top notch um, presentations and celebration. Really, really very well done. Um, the other thing uh, that I did was I participated in the regional policy board for our SELPA, or, which um, includes Castro Valley, Hayward, San Leandro, and San Lorenzo school districts for special education. And um, so there are four board members that go to that from each of the districts. And um, I, uh, there were three new people and one person who had been there before. So I nominated the person, the one person who had been there before to be the president and he nominated me to be the vice president. So uh, there we are with that. And then uh, the 
two most enjoyable things that I got to do were to uh, visit the hub at Canyon Middle School and actually see students. I was like, just made my, I, I've just, I miss students so much. It was just so wonderful to see. And they are in the library. They're probably distanced even more than six feet apart. Everybody was wearing their masks. They were so engaged. Um, the adults that were around were happy, delightful, positive people. And um, that hub just looked terrific. Um, and then uh, today I got to go visit uh, CVE, Castro Valley Elementary. And I was able to uh, see the two hubs there, one general ed and one special ed and talk to the principal. And it was uh, really delightful to, to visit CVE as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dolly. Vice President Theodore. So I represented our board at the uh, ROP meeting, the Regional Occupational Program meeting. Um, and it was really an orientation meeting. There were, um, well, I guess I'm, I'm new, even though I've sat on this board before, but only one returning board member and three new members. The other two um, representatives from Hayward and San Leandro were new to the ROP. Um, the representative from San, San Lorenzo um, was nominated and elected president and I'm serving as vice president of ROP this year. Um, so they gave a wonderful overview for the new members about the ROP program and of course the challenges um, in serving students and providing internships and all of those usual opportunities that students get um, by participating in ROP. Um, but, you know, they did it. They actually had lots of engagement and lots more businesses um, and organizations um, coming and presenting to students. And, and there were lots of opportunities for students to learn, even though they didn't get the hands-on internships that students normally do with ROP. Um, and then ROP has started a new program. I can't remember what it's called. But it was a partnership with a health, um, a, a community health center, where the community health center was supposed to provide case management services, and ROP would provide um, education and vocational opportunities for immigrant students or unstably housed or unhoused students. Um, and this last year was the first year, so of course it was it didn't go as planned. The, the health center ended up backing out um, and they were pri providing the case management. So the ROP took on all of that and um, brought, I think they said 40 students through that program in their first year, which I think is incredible considering, you know, they're a school, not a case management system but they were able to provide those services to students and meet their needs as well as a really enriching program in a time where we can't even sit in the same room together. So I'm excited to be serving on this board again and learning more about that program as it develops and as we you know, enter into the next phase of this pandemic. That's it. Thank you, Dot. I think we'd all agree that Linda Granger is a genius and probably the second uh, best superintendent in the state of California. I won't mention the first one since she's here. We don't want her head to get too big. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I was in a few things. One, I, I, I'm, I believe these were since our last meeting, uh, the community alliance meeting, not the book club, but the, alliance, the actual community alliance meeting. And I'm looking forward to the meeting next week, I think, when we hope we will be moving forward with some uh, concrete goals and so forth for that organization to undertake. Um, I think several of us were involved in the capital advisors briefing on the budget, and that was really, as it always is, very worthwhile. As I believe since we met the last time, um, I received an email from a high school student who is part of the uh, 
I hope I don't get this wrong, but I think it's the uh, Women of Color for Change Committee at Castro Valley High School. They were asking for some assistance with getting information out to students about human trafficking. And I will say that uh, Parveen and I were able to arrange for Nancy O'Malley, our district attorney, to be interviewed by these students um, live uh, on I February 3rd, I believe, or March 3rd, that's right. March 3rd, uh, and Mr. Torpy has uh, put this in as Trojan time for the high school. So all the students will hear the DA talk about human trafficking, which is a very serious problem uh, and in which she has a special interest. Um, and so that'll be a really terrific thing. Uh, Michael mentioned the Ed Foundation. I do want to bring up the Rotary for a couple of things that are uh, related to the school district. You might have seen in today's forum the ad for the talk by John Perkins, uh, who's a physicist at Lawrence Livermore. This is a joint project by Rotary and the Ed Foundation. This talk will be at six o'clock on February 16th, and you can register on the Rotary website to join in that. It's free and open to everybody. And we're hoping to get a lot of students involved in that. And since Dot brought up the um, ROP, I'll mention also we have reactivated our vocational committee and we have a very extremely active group working with the ROP or with the career uh, education teachers at Castro Valley High School to arrange for speakers, which they have a difficult time doing, but uh, it's an extraordinary uh, committee that's working on that, they are just amazing in how much work they've accomplished in no time. So that's all I have. Um, so thanks to everybody who's still on the line with us. There actually are about 14 or 15 people still listening to us. Thank you very much for listening to the bitter end with us. Uh, we appreciate your being here. Those of us who are on the board and the superintendent are gonna retire now again to close session. Arvin, I don't think we really need the assistant soups on this part if you no, dismiss they, them. Yeah. So it'll be the six of us going back to closed session. And we, I can say that we will report out again when we finish with our business in closed session. Uh, but I can't say that I know when that is. So. My apologies for that, but we'll be as short as we can be. So thanks to everybody for attending. And, you know, it's I have it now is 943, and I will suggest that we reconvene in closed session maybe at 950. Is that okay with everyone? Of course. Great. Thanks very much. I'll see you in a few minutes. Thanks to everybody for being here. See you at the next meeting. Wow, a lot of clicks to get back here, it seems like. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, we are back in open session. Um, one second, I just want to see something. I just want to say we have one person who is an attendee, Kelly O'Hearn. Thank you very much for being with us to the very bitter end. Um, we are back, and I have to say, I hope it's not a disappointment to you, Kelly, but the board took no action in that last half of our closed session. So thank you all for being here, and uh, look forward to seeing you all in the near future. A lot of hard work tonight, a lot of good things. Good night to everybody. Thanks, Amy.